uh, you know that uh, we started the nervous system and in last lecture uh, we mentioned that nervous system is divided into two parts central nervous system and peripheral nervous system right cns and pns central nervous system includes brain and the spinal cord so today we'll talk about the brain okay and in next class we'll talk about the spinal cord <coughs> First, uh, we will see the protection of the brain, how your brain is protected, okay, in your body. You know that your brain is the most important organ, most powerful organ of the body, right? So, the brain must be protected heavily. So we'll see how your brain is protected. Then inside the brain, you have fluid-filled cavities. Those are called ventricles. We'll talk about the ventricles. And the fluid inside the ventricle is called a cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Okay? So we'll talk about the ventricles and CSF. Then we'll see parts of the brain and surface markings on the brain. On the surface of the brain, if you see the brain surface, there are sulci, groups, many groups. So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about the lobes in the brain. Your brain consists of two hemispheres, or cerebral hemispheres, okay? And in each hemisphere, or each half, you have four lobes. So we'll see what are those lobes in the brain, or hemisphere. We have already talked about the white matter and gray matter, and I explained why some areas are white, some areas are gray. So we'll skip that. On the surface of the brain, you have many functional areas. We will see the important functional areas on the surface of the brain. Brain surface is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex is the outer layer, surface of the brain. Okay? So in the cortex, you have many functional areas. <coughs> then we will talk about the homunculi. Homunculi are maps, your whole body maps in the brain. So in certain areas in your brain, you have your entire body map. That is very interesting, right? We'll talk about that. We'll see what are those maps, body maps on the brain. First, the protection. The number of structures protect your brain, if you see from outside to inside, first is the skull, right, we know that. Then under that, you have the covering of the bone, that is called the periosteum, you already know that. Periosteum is the covering of the bone, and under the periosteum, you have the cranial bone, right? And under the bone, you have meninges, now, meninges, this connective tissue membrane and it has three layers. Okay? Meninges has three layers. Outermost is called dura or dura matter. Middle one is arachnoid matter and innermost one is called pia matter. So, those are three layers of meninges. Dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter, okay? So, this is the skin, skull, then you have the periosteum, 
then you have the bone, okay? Then under the bone, you have three meninges. The outermost one is the dura mater, which is the toughest one and thickest one. So thickest and toughest, outermost is the dura, this one, okay? Remember, if I ask you which one is the toughest and thickest one, that's the outermost one, dura mater. And then there is a space. And the second layer is the arachnoid matter. So this is the arachnoid, okay? And the innermost one is the pia matter, which is the thinnest one and attached to the veil surface. So this is the pia, the innermost one and it is directly attached to the brain tissue. So this is the brain, okay? So, brain tissue, okay? So this is the brain, and pia is attached to the brain surface, okay, directly. Then there is a gap, then arachnoid, then there is a gap, then dura, okay? So this space, under the dura matter is called sub-dura. Next time, sub means under dura matter. So this is called sub-dura space under the dura matter. That means between dura and arachnoid. And under the arachnoid, this space is called sub-arachnoid space. Next sense. Arachnoid space, okay? Under the arachnoid matter. Make sense? So subdural, subarachnoid, subarachnoidal space. This space is very important. Why? Because cerebrospinal fluid, that important fluid, is located in subarachnoid space. So in this space you have cerebrospinal fluid. Okay? <coughs> and that fluid protects your brain. Okay. <coughs> Sometimes uh, if injury occurs, you know, uh, your skull bone breaks, bleeding will occur and that blood can accumulate in this space. If blood accumulates in subdural space, this is called subdural hematoma. Hematoma is the accumulation of blood, right? So since it is in subdural space, this is called subdural hematoma. Make sense? So, subdural hematoma. If blood accumulation occurs here, that is called subarachnoidal hematoma. Okay. So it can happen in these spaces. Okay. Hematoma or accumulation of blood can occur due to injury. Okay. So those are the protections of your brain from outside to inside. Uh, if I ask you, those are the structures protecting your brain. Ventricles are the fluid filled cavities inside the brain. And that fluid is the cerebrospinal fluid. So you see, cerebrospinal fluid is present in subarachnoid space as well as inside the ventricles. So those are the locations where you have the cerebrospinal fluid. And these fluid filled cavities or ventricles are connected to each other. So the fluid can go from one ventricle to another. Make sense? They are connected. So we'll see what are the ventricles. We have four ventricles in the brain. Two are lateral ventricles, one third ventricle, and one fourth ventricle. So those are the ventricles. And if you see the location inside the brain, you can 
let's see from outside because those are located inside, but these are the locations inside the brain. If you look this way from the front, this is how they are located inside the brain. If you look from the side this way, this is how they are located inside the brain. Okay, how you will see. Now, these two are lateral ventricles. Okay, these two are lateral ventricles. And this is the third ventricle here. And this is the fourth ventricle. Now you see, lateral ventricles are connected to third ventricle by this small tube. And those are called intraventricular foramen. Makes sense. Intra Forum, connecting the lateral and third. Third and fourth are connected by <coughs> cerebral aqueduct. So, third and fourth are connected by the tube that is called cerebral aqueduct. So, those are the ventricles and how they are connected, right? Now, if fluid accumulates more in one ventricle, it can easily, the pressure will increase, so it will go to third and fourth, right? Make sense? If in one ventricle fluid pressure increases, fluid will go to another ventricle. Sometimes, <coughs> if tumor grows here, that will press the connections and block the passage. And that can cause the accumulation of fluid because fluid will not be able to get out. Make sense? If tumor or any growth blocks that uh, tube by pressure, then fluid will start to build up, accumulate inside the ventricle. And what will happen, you see, if fluid more and more accumulate inside the ventricles, the ventricle will get what? Big, right? Enlargement of the ventricle. And that will enlarge the brain because fluid is accumulating inside the brain, right? And that is called hydrocephalus. Hydro means what? Water. Yeah, so fluid, water. <coughs> hydrocephalus. Do you uh, remember the term cephalus? Cephalic means head, right? Cephalic indicates head. So fluid in the head, water in the head. So that is hydrocephalus. Now, you know that <coughs> the sutures connect the cranial bones, right? Sutures are the joints. And in adults, the sutures are already fixed, right? No movement of it. So the skull cannot get big. Will stay like that, right? But in infants, if you see, you see the sutures are not yet, you know, formed. There are spaces. You will see. You will see the movement. So, what happens if hydrocephalus occurs in infants? The head will get bigger because brain will get bigger, right? And since the cranial bones are not fused yet, they can expand. Okay. So the head will look big. Is it clear? But in adults, the pressure will increase, but the skull will not expand. Make sense? Will remain the same. So that is more dangerous, right? Because you have no way to see. In infants, you can see the head is getting big, right? So you will know that you know uh, fluid is accumulating, and you can drain the fluid out, right? And give the treatment. But in adults, it, it other complications um, occur, right? Anyway, so that is the accumulation of fluid inside the ventricles and subsequent uh, occurrence of hydrocephalus. <coughs> From where that fluid comes? Uh, the fluid is secreted by a capillary plexus attached to the roof of the ventricle. If this is the ventricle, on the roof or ceiling of the ventricle, the capillary plexus, that is called choroid plexus, is attached. And from the choroid plexus, the fluid is secreted 
into the vertical. Okay, so verticals. <coughs> I have chord plexus and that secretes the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, important functions of the cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid protects your brain because around the brain, not only around the brain, around the spinal cord, you have cerebrospinal fluid. So around the brain, as well as around the spinal cord, you have cerebrospinal fluid, like this. This is spinal cord, cerebrospinal fluid around the spinal cord. So uh, you know, uh, I mentioned sometimes you ride on roller coasters, right? Suddenly moves. Or if you break your car suddenly, right? That shakes your head a lot, suddenly, right? Moves your head. And if there was no cerebrospinal fluid between the brain and the hard bone skull, right? Then what would have happened? The brain would hit the skull, right? And will get damaged. But that doesn't happen, right? Because of that fluid. The fluid protects the brain. Is it clear? Uh, very important. Uh, the fluid contains nutrients and neurochemicals and that keep the brain tissue healthy and uh, you know uh, more uh, alive or lively. So uh, provides nutrition and um, uh, keeps the brain tissue healthy. Okay, so here you see the cord plexus, the nerve structures and that secrete the cerebrospinal fluid into the ventricle. This is uh, showing the location of cerebrospinal fluid. So you already know that cerebrospinal fluid is located in subarachnoid space around the brain and the spinal cord, right? So this is the spinal cord. Around the spinal cord, you have cerebrospinal fluid. Around the brain, you have cerebrospinal fluid, clear? In subarachnoid space. <coughs> as well as inside the ventricles. You see the cerebrospinal fluid is inside the ventricles. Cord plexus secretes the cerebrospinal fluid, okay? And it circulates. Parts of the brain. Your brain uh, can be divided into four parts. The largest part is called the cerebrum. So we divide the brain into four parts. Cerebrum, number one, number two, diencephalon, number three, stem and cerebellum. Okay? So we divide the entire brain into these four parts. Is it clear? Four parts. This is the largest part. If I show you the brain, the first thing that you see, the whole large part, that is the cerebrum. And it consists of two hemispheres. Right and left hemispheres. Hemi means half sphere. Is the whole cerebrum is the whole cerebrum is the sphere and hemisphere is half of it. Hemisphere. Right? Half of the sphere. Sphere is the cerebrum. So you have right and left half. Sphere. That is the largest part. Then diencephalon. Diencephalon, this part, consists of following structures. Thalamus. Diencephalon consists of a thalamus. Hypothalamus, under the thalamus. pituitary gland, okay? So those are the parts of diencephalon. Is it clear? 
here. Okay. Brain stem consists of three parts. Mid brain. Cerebellum uh, is on this structure. So these are the four main parts of the brain, and each of these three parts have structures inside it. Now I'll briefly uh, talk a little bit talk about the functions. Just know that if I ask you cerebrum, cerebrum has the outer layer. Remember, I mentioned what is it called? Yeah. No, the outer most layer cortex, cerebral cortex. Remember that the covering of the cerebrum. So cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the cerebrum, and that has many functional areas. Okay, so cerebrum has many functional. Areas. We'll talk about these functional areas later. Just know that cerebral cortex has many functional areas. Okay. Then thalamus, very important structure in your brain. Okay. Thalamus is called major sensory. Measure sensory relay state. Make sense? That means what? The sensory signals are relayed there. Have you seen relay race? One person runs, right? And gives the stick to the next person, right? He will run up to a certain distance and will give it to another one, right? So what happens is see here that when I touch my skin, the touch signal from the skin goes where? All the way to the brain, right? We have talked about that. So the touch signal is taken to the brain, right? But this is a long distance. Make sense? One neuron cannot take it from here to here all the way to the brain, right? So at certain areas, one neuron gives signal to next. Okay? And next one will give take it up to certain distance, right? And will give it to another group of neurons. That's how the signal is taken to the brain. So before the signal goes, reaches to the brain, finally, thalamus is the location where all sensory, almost all sensory signals are relayed in thalamus. Okay? So most of the sensory signals are relayed in the thalamus before it finally goes to the brain. Is it clear? So that's why it is called the major sensory relay station. Your pain, touch, temperature, right? Your taste signal, your visual signal, auditory signal, all those sensory signals are related in the where? Thalamus. Is it clear? Okay. So, very important structure in your brain. Okay. Then hypothalamus. Under the thalamus, you have hypothalamus. That's why it is called hypo, below. Now, hypothalamus has interesting functions. I'll just mention a couple of those, okay? Number one, hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. How you see, this is the thalamus, this is the hypothalamus, and this is the pituitary gland. This is pituitary gland, okay? So this is thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland. So pituitary is just under the hypothalamus, connected to the hypothalamus. And hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. So number one, Function, you can write it down of hypothalamus is what? Controlling the pituitary. Make sense? Because pituitary is attached to it. Number one. I'll ask all this in the exam, okay? So, number two. <coughs> uh, so, let me write it down. Controls pituitary. Number two, hypothalamus.
hypothalamus controls food and water intake. This is interesting. Controls food and water intake. That means how much you will drink intake, right? And eat. That is controlled by what? You don't eat all day, right? When you are hungry, you think you will eat everything, right? A lot of food. Then you start eating, right? And after a few minutes, you start to lose what? Interest. And at one point, you stop eating, right? That's what happens. So who tells you? You don't have to eat anymore, hypothalamus. Because when you, you are hungry, in your blood, right? Nu nutrition is down, right? So you feel that you should get nutrition. Is it clear? And when you start to eat, nutrition in your blood starts to go up, right? When you are thirsty, water in your blood is less, right? Then when you start to drink, water increases, right? And those tells the hypothalamus that, you know, I am saturated. I don't need any more, okay? So hypothalamus will stop your desire. Stop your desire to eat or, or to eat and drink. Is it clear? So hypothalamus controls food and what I take. Now interesting, if hypothalamus is disturbed or damaged, then what will happen? What can happen? The person may not know where to stop. Make sense? And that causes a problem. You know, uh, those people who have problem in hypothalamus, some of them you will see keep eating and drinking. Okay, a lot. And gradually gets what? Big, right? Big, big heels, right? And uh, uh, that is a problem in uh, disorders in hypothalamus. Could be a problem. Okay. Uh, <coughs> hypothalamus, you can write down another one. Uh, you already know. Have you heard of hypothalamus before? A few days ago, right? It regulates the body temperature, right? Send signal to the sweat gland. Release, secret water, right? So, temperature regulation. So remember those three, if I ask you uh, what are the important functions of the hypothalamus. Uh, number one, controls the pituitary gland. Number two, controls the food and water intake and temperature regulation. It has other functions, just remember those three. Pituitary gland, you all know that is called what? Master. Master gland, right? So that is the boss of other endocrine glands of your body. Now, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata belong to the brain stem. As a whole, I will mention two important functions of brain stem. Number one, important reflexes. You already know reflex. So, important reflexes are controlled by the brain stem, number one. Number two, vital control centers like your, your cardiovascular and respiratory centers. So, respiratory and cardiovascular system, these centers are located in the brain stem. So, respiratory centers and cardiovascular centers are located in the brain stem. So your heart is controlled, your breathing is controlled by the brain stem. So this is a very important structure around here in your body. And if, you know, this brain stem lesion occurs, damage occurs, then the person can die immediately because you have respiratory right and cardiac centers there. So those centers, they stop, your heart will stop your breathing. Make sense? So 
tail part. Cerebellum. This part, just know that is mainly responsible for equilibrium. Equilibrium. Balance of the body. Now sometimes you will see uh, some people have very good balance, right? The body, if they practice. So uh, you'll see it sometimes in, in uh, circus. trained from their great childhood, okay, early stage of life. So their cerebellum gets well trained. Make sense? We know cerebellum controls the balance and equilibrium of the body. And if we can train the cerebellum better, right, they will perform better. It will perform better. So the person will have better balance and equilibrium. So those are the parts of the brain and their functions, okay? Let's move forward. This whole thing is the cerebrum. Okay. Has two hemispheres. This is the diencephalon. This is thalamus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland. This is the brain stem, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata. Okay. And this is the cerebellum. So the largest part is the cerebrum. Okay. <coughs> now, you see, uh, each hemisphere has four lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. It's by four different colors um, you have shown here. So frontal lobe, you know this is the frontal lobe, right? You remember that? Frontal, this is parietal, temporal, right? Occipital. So those lobes are kind of, you know, uh, under those bones. Frontal lobe is more or less under frontal bone, okay? Parietal lobe is more or less under parietal, temporal under temporal bone, and occipital under the occipital bone. Okay? So those are four lobes in each hemisphere. That means each half. So in this side you have four lobes, in the other side you have four lobes. Make sense? Now, uh, if you see the surface of the cerebrum, you see many groups, many groups, right? Those are called sulci. So on the surface of the cerebrum, you have groups. Most of those groups are shallow groups, like this. So I'm looking at the surface. So you see, these are the groups and ridges in between the groups. So these shallow groups are called sulci. Some people say sulci. Sulcus is singular. If I indicate only one, that is a sulcus. If I indicate more than one, sulci or sulci. So we have many shallow groups or sulci on the surface. But we have few also deep groups like this. So you see, this is a deep one and that is called a fissure. Fissure, okay? So fissure is a deep group, right? And sulcus is a shallow group. Most of those groups are shallow. Sulci. Okay, <clears throat> and in between sulci, the area, this is called gyrus. Again, gyrus is singular. If I say gyri, that is plural, okay? So, like sulcus and sulci, or sulci, gyrus and gyrus. So the ridges are gyro in between sulci. So uh, that is how the surface of the cerebrum is. If 
someone has four groups, okay, that means what? The surface is bigger or less? Total surface. Surface is what? Big, right? Like you know, the cotton. If you fold more, right? If, if you can fold more, that means what? It is big, right? When you will spread it, it will be big, right? If less force, that means less surface area. Is it clear? So same exactly in your brain surface, cerebral cortex has what? Many pores, right? Sulci. The person who has more sulci, that means what? Has bigger surface. More neurons. Bigger surface means what? More neurons there, right? And more neurons means what? Better function. Neurons are the cells of the brain, right? So if you have more cells, better function, right? So smart people, those people are smarter, they have more, uh, research has shown that they have more sulci, force, right? Okay, so how you can create more sulci? <laughs> if, if you study more, right? If you learn more, right? Practice more. Those groups will be created. In human brain, you have much more sulci than other creatures. Because human brain is much smarter, right? In many ways than other creatures. You know that, right? If you see all the you know, elephant or big creatures, even the brain is big, the folding is less. You will see less force there. Okay? In general. So those are the uh, groups, shallow and deep. Now, I told you that in the cerebral cortex, you have many functional areas. Cerebral cortex has many functional areas. That means on the brain surface, you have many functional areas. We'll just see few of those important ones, okay? First, this is the back of the frontal lobe, all the way back here. You have a very important functional area, that is the visual cortex, primary visual cortex, you see here. That means the visual signal from the eye goes there. That's the primary, primary means what? Main, right? Primary is the main one. So from the eye, the signal goes to primary visual cortex. That means in the back of your cerebrum. <coughs> Here, just the upper part of the temporal lobe. This is the temporal lobe. Here, near the back of the lateral sulcus. This is the lateral sulcus. And this area is called the primary auditory cortex. That means the sound signal from the ear goes to that area. So from the eye, signal goes here. From the ear, signal goes here. Primary auditory cortex. Now, you see here, this is a very important sulcus. You need to know. This sulcus separating frontal lobe and parietal lobe. This is called the central sulcus. So, central sulcus separates the frontal and parietal lobes. And this is the central sulcus. So, central sulcus. Okay? Why this is important? Number one, it separates frontal lobe and parietal lobe. And in front of central sulcus, this gyrus, this one, is called primary model. Primary model cortex. Very important. And behind the central sulcus, this gyrus is called primary somato sensor. These two very important gyri are separated by the central sulcus. So now let's see here. 
this is the central sulcus and this red one is primary motor cortex and this is blue one primary somatosensory cortex primary means main right so motor is the signal that goes to the muscles and glands in uh, last class i mentioned so from the brain the motor signal goes to the muscles to move the body parts make sense contract the muscles so <coughs> From this area, signal goes to the muscles to move your body parts, motor control. And that's why it is called the primary motor area or cortex. Now this area, what it does? Primary somatosensory, sensory, right? The sensory area receives the sensory signal. Primary somatosensory, that means main somatosensory. Touch, pain, temperature, those signals go to blue area, primary somatosensory cortex. So motor output from the motor cortex goes to the muscles to cause what? Movement, right? You know, motor goes out from the brain, we, talk, we talked about that. And sensory goes towards the brain, right? So touch, pain, temperature, those important sensory signals go here. And from here, the signal goes down to control the muscles of your body. Those are two very important areas. Now you see here, in the frontal lobe, almost in the middle of the frontal lobe, this area within the dotted line is called Broca's area. You see here, Broca's area is interesting. Uh, this area controls your speech production. Controls what? Production of speech, right? So. The name Broca's came from a French neurologist who had a patient many years ago who had problem in speech production, okay? Because he got, the patient got a stroke and after the stroke, he suffered from that problem, okay? So he treated that patient for many years and when that patient died, he examined his brain, okay? All areas he looked under the microscope found that this area was lesioned, damaged, make sense? So he first said that this area could be responsible for the production of speech, make sense, right? And uh, after the death of Brocas, the scientist, uh, neurologist, this area has been named after his name, Brocas, okay? Trans neurologist. So production of speech, that means, now if you can think, this area sends signal where? Who produces sound? Yeah. Vocal cord inside the larynx, right? You know that, vocal cord. So that area sends signal to the vocal cord, okay? To produce sound. Here, you see, part of it in temporal is in temporal, part of it is in parietal lobe within this dotted line. This area is also very interesting. This area is called Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is responsible for understanding speech. Responsible for what? Understanding. So production and understanding are two different things, right? So if lesion occurs here, this area is damaged by stroke or something, then what will happen? This person will be able to produce speech, right? Because his, this area is intact, is it clear? So he'll be able, able to do what? Produce speech, normal. But we'll have problem in what? Understanding, understanding his speech, right? So he will not understand what another person is telling, say, is it clear? Two different things. Uh, so just know uh, those uh, few important areas. Now as a whole, in human brain, this part is well developed than other creatures. Which part? The frontal part okay, of the brain. Why? How human brain is different than other creatures? What do you think? Just think and tell me. If you're wrong, no problem. Hello? 
But uh, yeah, th that is true. But just think in general that what makes your brain different? What you can do more than other creatures? Reasoning. Tell me. Reasoning. Reasoning, right? Reasoning. Logic, intelligence, right? Mathematics. Other cases, they cannot do two plus two, or, right? Probably they will do that. One. But we can do much, much more uh, difficult maths, right? So, uh, very good. So, human brain has much better ability, right, to do those high order functions. Higher order brain functions, we say higher order brain functions, right? Intelligence, reasoning, right? Doing math, problem solving, right? Creative thinking.